uh, here i present a 6 year old uh, female child uh, who is selling from navalgun dharwad who is right handed by, uh, and uh, informant being mother and uh, she is reliable date of admission was on 23rd of june and uh, examined on 30th of june uh, 2021 chief complaints being complaints of uh, progressive swelling while walking since 4 years aggravated since 15 days complaints of progressive slurring of speech since 2 years complaints of deviation of the neck to the left side since 15 days history of presenting illness child was apparently all right until 4 years ago uh, when she uh, when she was 2 uh, years of age then uh, the mother noticed um, uh, swaying in all directions while walking which was insidious in onset progressive over the last 4 years with no improvement in the symptoms and no waxing and waning of symptoms complaints of increased swaying from last 15 days there is no complaints of multiple falls falls history of slurring of speech gradually progressive since 2 years associated with low tone with unclear pronunciation but was able to comprehend with meaning uh, also complaints of deviation of the neck to the left side since 15 days non progressive with no aggravating factors not associated with pain or restriction of movements of the neck in other directions no deviation noted during sleep child can walk without support with both the feet wide apart with swaying child is able to eat food with hand by herself uh, notice change in handwriting in the form of uh, bigger letters not in one line history of upper respiratory tract infection is present uh, in terms of cold and ear discharge no history of trauma able to lift the arm above head able to comb hair mix food and dress herself able to grip footwear without slipping able to lift the head from bed and sit up from a supine position not able to climb upstairs due to swaying uh, there is no history of loss of consciousness or uh, convulsions able to perceive temperature of hot and cold water able to perceive pain no history of bladder or bowel uh, involvement uh, no history uh, suggestive of abnormal eye movements or uh, squint no history of dooling of saliva collection of uh, food in the cheek deviation of the mouth to while eating no history of hearing abnormalities or tinnitus no history of nasal regurgitation swallowing difficulties no history of deviation of the tongue to any side no history of uh, spinal deformities or foot deformities no history of involuntary movements no history of abnormalities in the eye no history of dryness of the skin vision problems no history of uh, headache vomiting or diplopia no history of fever vomiting diarrhea or rash and uh, no emotional ability or behavior problems past history uh, history of three admissions in the past first one was at 2 years of age uh, for swaying at uh, vaidehi hospital bangalore uh, blood investigations were done and was said to have movement disorder which was uh, hereditary one year back uh, admitted for fever and ear discharge and 6 uh, months back was admitted for fever history of multiple opd visits uh, for cold and ear discharge okay family history uh, there is a history of uh, similar complaints in a uh, 15 year old um, uh elder sibling and uh, there is history of uh, uh, death of an elder uh, sibling uh, and the cause of which is unknown and uh, his uh, 12 year old uh, elder sibling who is um, live and uh, healthy yeah, it is a third degree consanguineous marriage okay uh, history of similar complaints in the elder brother uh, elder sibling was normal till 6 years of age and symptoms of swaying and frequent falls was started at 6 year of age uh, he has slurring of speech uh, he is non ambulatory without any support not able to eat by uh, himself or uh, self care diagnosed as hereditary ataxia at 6 uh, years of age at uh, vaidehi hospital uh, antenatal and uh, b- birth history was uh, no- not contributory okay uh, developmental history gross motor milestones are 75 percentage uh, with developmental quotient fine motor uh, dq was 66.5 percentage and language uh, developmental question is 80 percentage and uh, social uh, milestones uh, developmental question is 100 percentage uh, immunization history it is uh, immunized up to date uh, diet history uh, child consumes both vegetarian and uh, non vegetarian diet with a uh, deficient in uh, calories and proteins uh, socio economic history um, father was uh, studied up to 10th standard who is a farmer mother studied up to 5th standard who is homemaker but they live in a kacha house uh sanitary to- toilet is present outside lpg gas and firewood is used for cooking lower so- belong to low socio economic status uh coming to summary 6 year old female child uh, fourth born to a third degree consanguineous marriage belonging to lower socio economic status with a dietary deficit of 430 kilocalories and uh, 3.2 grams of proteins immunized appropriately with no developmental delay with no significant antenatal or birth uh, history 
with significant family history of similar complaints in the elder sibling with uh, recurrent upper respiratory tract infection uh, bought with history of uh, chronic progressive ataxia since the age of 2 years now it which has aggravated since uh, 15 days okay so we will first uh, try to find out you have told that it is third degree consanguinity no ma yes ma'am so what do you understand by first degree consanguinity second degree and third degree uh first degree consanguinity is uh, between uh, the siblings ma'am uh, second degree is uh, between uh, maternal or paternal uh, aunt or uh, uncle and the third degree is uh, between cousins okay good so this is uh, third degree mm-hmm. so first degree is between brother sisters uh, father mother also is also said as first degree sometimes it happens i think so then um, okay agree so this third degree consanguinity they are uh, up to 2 years the child was normal the elder one is normal till 6 years so i started with unsteadiness yes. uh, at that time what about the upper limb was there any upper limb in coordination no no progress is swaying only while walking so sway, swaying means which part of the uh, nervous system can produce swaying when you are walking which all parts no uh the cerebellum uh, the posterior columns of the spinal cord and uh, the vestibular system so it could be cerebellar it could be posterior column it could be vestibular sometimes very small children even waddling when waddling they will call it as sway so finally when you examine everything it may turn out to be a muscle disease also so that is also there so sway, lower limb is involved at that point of time upper limb is not involved so which all parts of the uh, neuro axis we have to localize that is the first question so you have told it is a broad based gait swaying to either side bilateral not unilateral so if it is cerebellar where it will be if it is posterior column uh, how it will manifest and if it is spino cerebellar tract how it will manifest and which each, each one we will try to analyze so so developmentally the child was initially normal so it is not a static insult generally when children we will uh, consider an unsteady child is the child having a uh, static ataxia so you have got static ataxia like uh, uh, cerebral palsy no ataxic cerebral palsy so child will have a static ataxia or you have got conditions like uh, hind brain dysgenesis syndromes where developmentally the hind brain does not develop so they are all non progressive so you see the static at a post traumatic following trauma you get some cerebellar injury or some kind of encephalitis or heat stroke so these things can involve cerebellum and they leave a deficit which is non progressive but in your child it is progressive so it comes under progressive so you see cerebellar ataxia is the first question so how to differentiate at this point cerebellar ataxia sensory ataxia all of you surely know i am sure but still we will go through that exercise for those small boys and girls your small boy only so cerebellar ataxia is something which involves it will be either side to side swaying the or it will be really side to side swaying we call it as gentle swaying or it will be reeling is a wide arc kind of uh, sway so which part of the cerebellum will produce that so if it is you know that cerebellar common plus you have got that gano textbook of physiology where you have got the three monkey common plus so cerebellum has got the three monkey common plus so wherever the leg area is there that part if it is involved you will get ataxia so leg area is there in the floccular nodular lobe as well as in the paleo cerebellum and it is a part of the cerebellum so what will be the feature if it is paleo cerebellum paleo cerebellum will produce only swaying because paleo cerebellum contains leg fibers it does not contain upper limb it does not contain head and neck so uh, and it is not connected to any other uh, its connections are not to structures which produce other symptoms only gait attacks so general swaying gait it can be in the paleo cerebellum one suppose in floccular nodular lobe it is connected to the vestibular nucleus the nu- uh, nucleus of the pa- neo cerebellum is dendrite nucleus and uh, paleo cerebellum is emboliformis and floccular nodular lobe is vestibular nucleus 
because it is linked to the vestibular nucleus it will be a very wide arc vestibular type of swing like the classical drunken gait so it's a reeling they go through a very wide arc so this child does not seems to have gone through a reeling type so it is not clocular nodular lobe if it is in the cerebellum probably it is palio cerebellum so can it be in the vermis vermis also produce kind of a gait abnormality but it will be more of a trunk trunk because you see the trunk of the three monkeys is in the vermis so trunkal swaying will be more than the gait so trunkal swaying will be transmitted to the gait next the child will usually have titubation so titubation and trunk swaying more than the gait is typical of vermis so in the cerebellum if you think it looks more closer to the palio cerebellum so can it be in the pedangles next question you want us can it be in the pedangles that is just for learning purpose you got superior cerebellar pedangle you got middle cerebellar pedangle you got inferior cerebellar pedangle superior cerebellar pedangle has got a important uh, pathway that is the uh, from the dendrite nucleus to the red nucleus to the thalamus and cortex so dendrito rubro thalamo cortical pathway that is the most important structure many other structures are there many afferents are there the most important efferent is the dendrito rubro thalamo cortical pathway so this produces upper limb involvement because it contains fibers which come from the upper limb whereas our patient has got lower limb so very unlikely to be in the superior cerebellar pedangle and uh, you know superior cerebellar pedangle uh, can produce mild gait ataxia Uh, would you like to tell me why occasionally gait ataxia can happen in superior cerebellar pedangle even though predominantly dendrito rubro it's a rubral tremor horizontal action tremor of the upper limb with the um, upper there limb. is involvement of uh, uncinate fasciculus of russell uh, wonderful uh, very good it is a very wonderful answer so that can produce a gait ataxia yeah. but the predominant thing will be upper limb so superior cerebellar pedangle less likely next middle cerebellar pedangle only one structure is there that is a cortico uh, pondo cerebellar fiber it contains both the cortico spinal pathway and the cortico cerebellar pathway so this will produce spastic ataxia so spasticity with ataxia not just swaying the limb is also stiff the child may drag they may have a pyramidal type of foot drop so trip and fall so those things are there you will think of a middle cerebellar pedangle inferior cerebellar pedangle of course looks like the floccular nodular lobe because main structure in that is vestibular so severe vertigo vomiting reeling type of gait in the absence of other brain stem features you will put it under the pedangle second important point to remember about the pedangle pedangles will never affect the speech so this child progress to a speech involvement so speech involvement never happens in the pedangle and i signs except the inferior cerebellar pedangle can produce a vestibular type of nystagmus otherwise i signs do not happen in the pedangles only the vestibular type of nystagmus not the classical cerebellar nystagmus so that is about the pedangle so apparently it looks like a palio cerebellum involvement probably ma'am uh, i had a doubt ma'am yes ma'am ma'am Absol- in superior superior cerebellar pedangle there is a uh, uh, anterior spinal cerebellar fibers uh, Yes. which are from the lower limbs so yes uh, why not uh, lower limb ataxia you see that is a very small uh, normally what you get you do not get a specific degeneration of the spinal cerebellar tract when the pedangles are involved you get spinal spinal cerebellar tracts originate from the clock's column and they mainly carry some pro- spindle afferents proprioceptive afferents and um, spindle afferents that is proprioception means not posterior column it is a muscle position awareness from the lower limbs and this is uh, specifically producing symptoms only when there is a spinal cord degeneration so there will be lot of spasticity lot of posterior column with the mild swaying when they are uh, during turns but in the pedangle even though it is an afferent you have got tecto cerebellar you have got sp- spinal cerebellar you have got trigeminal cerebellar all of them are there in the superior cerebellar pedangle 
but none of them produce symptoms. Tectocerebellar means head tilt should be there, eye movement abnormality should be there. None of these things produce symptoms because they are mainly concentrating on other areas. Tectocerebellar is tectal function. So only when the tectum is affected, the tectocerebellar fiber becomes affected. Only when the spinal cord is affected, spinocerebellar tract as such, or at least we cannot detect that. We cannot detect and say this is pedangle. So child may have some mild ataxia, yeah. maybe the spinocerebellar afferents in the superior cerebellar pedangle are degenerating, but very difficult for us to say this is in the pedangle unless the, the one which produces the specific, you have got something called specificity and sensitivity. You see, gait ataxia is not a very specific symptom. It's a sensitive symptom for cerebellar or, or its connection involvement, but it doesn't help us to specifically localize to the Superior spedangle. Specificity means uh, you are, uh, you are, uh, if I have to tell specific for you are final year MBBS students in Kubli uh, Medical College. No, that is very specific for you. But all way, uh, children who are wearing white coat are medical students. So that's a sin, uh, that is not having specificity. Like that, a mild degree of ataxia. If you want to call it as a clock column ataxia, that is the spinocerebellar tract. Clinically, a person is coming with posterior column spasticity, but you are surprised that when he's turning, he's having some kind of a swaying, which cannot be explained by the other tracks in the spinal cord. Then we will say this person has got additional involvement of spinal cord. In the superior cerebral pedangle, we will not be able to say if he just presents with the gait ataxia, because we want more specific features. That is the dendetorubrothalami. That is a specific thing that you can point. It might happen, but we cannot localize it that way. That is the thing. Any other doubt now? No. So we will progress. So that is, if this person is having cerebellar ataxia, we will like to put it in the anterior lobe of the cerebellum, more so because it is bilateral. It's not unilateral. Pedangle lesions are generally unilateral because they are all acquired lesions, except that Fragile leg syndrome can produce middle cerebellar pedangle bilaterally, but it is a male dominant disease. So fragile leg syndrome so is a male uh, syndrome where you get the pedangle involvement. Otherwise, acquired lesions, demyelinations, all those things only come. So maybe anterior lobe of the cerebellum. What will be the feature if it is sensory ataxia? Sensory ataxia, as you say, it is subjective ataxia is more than objective. It will not be side to side swing, it's a very bizarre gait. Sensory ataxia is because the person does not know where is the leg placed when you are walking. So prop, uh, you are not getting the information regarding the position of your limb. So you will have a very bizarre gait. It's not a side to side swing. And your eye, head is fixed on the limb if you have to be stable. So that means if you are knowing the position of your limb, limb by putting your eyes on your feet, you are all right. So one, it is not a side to side swing. It's a more bizarre and more subjective. Person will be feeling slightly panicky because he does not know where is his limb. And if he fixes his eyes on the feet, he is more better. And it aggravates during night. And other features of posterior column involvement, you may be able to demonstrate. And generally, there is a stamping type of gait. It's not a swaying gait, it is a stamping gait. If they do not know the depth, they lift it high and bring it down with the stamp. So stamping gait rather than a swaying, swaying gait, subjective incoordination more than objective. And they are little more bizarre than the classical swaying side to side. And uh, it aggravates in the night and it improves when the child or adult, whoever it is, fixes the eye on the uh, leg. So when they are watching the position of the leg, so they are more comfortable. So mostly they look at their legs and walk. That is sensory ataxia. Vestibular ataxia, it, vestibular ataxia, inferior cerebellar pedangle resemble each other. Severe vertigo, because vestibular apart is severe vertigo, vomiting, violent vomiting, and without any other brainstem features. And they may have ENT features <coughs> if there is a vestibular cochlear involvement. And they have the classical vestibular type of nystagmus with a slow component towards the side of pathology. So if the right vestibular neuronitis is there, the nystagmus will have a slow component to the right. When you are looking to the right or to the left, 
nystagmus will always have the slow component to the right and it will usually have a rotary component. All these have pathometer mechanisms, very easy to explain, but it will be a different topic by itself. I think I have taken one session on eye movement that if you know, uh, uh, go through that, it may be there in the YouTube, then you will know why the vestibular nystagmus is having a slow component towards the side of uh, abnormal uh, vestibular apparatus with a rotary component. Whereas cerebellar nystagmus, we classically call it as a gaze evoked nystagmus. That means if you are looking to the right side, fast component to the right. If you are looking to the left side, fast component to the left side. Why? Because, you know, there is something called a neural integrator. You, you can go through my eye movement talk. I think it is in the white army only. I think so. You can ask Vijay or whether yes. it is in some other session. White army only, no? Did I give it's an eye movement? Madam. Eye movement talk I gave. Huh? Yes, madam. It's there, madam. Yes, then you, you will get it. But there is something called a leaky neural integrator. There is a neural integrator which involves the brainstem, medulla, med, medulla as well as the cerebellum, which decides how much time my eye should stand on a target. So cerebellum control, supposing it is a uh, very important uh, thing I am trying to analyze, my gaze will be fixed on that for a longer time. That is determined by the uh, neural integrator. There is a mathematical relationship between the intention to move my eye and the intention to keep it on that target. That is determined by the neural integrator. So when the neural integrator fails, it is leaky. So it will not stay on the target of interest for the sufficient period of time, it will come back. So that is what happens in cerebellar nystagmus. Whereas vestibular nystagmus is due to imbalance in the semicircular canals. So that picture will be there in the talk, you can see. Because of the slow component is towards the side of uh, disease and fast component, whether you are looking to the right or you are looking to the left, if it is a right vestibular nucleus, slow component is to the right side. Then other vestibular features may be there and the environment will be spinning towards the side of disease and the uh, no, environment will be spinning away from the side of disease and patient will be swaying to the side of disease. Whereas in cerebellar disease, they sway depending on paleocerebellum or flocculonal lobe, which we have already discussed. Then patient will feel comfortable when he lies with the affected ear up in vestibular disease. Whereas there is no preferred position uh, which uh, reduces the symptoms in cerebellar disease. Mainly when they are lying down, they are comfortable. The vertigo is not that dominant. This vertigo is less in vestibular disease when the person lies with the affected ear up. So these points help us to know it is vestibular. Next, uh, spastic ataxia, of course, we have discussed. So, posterior column, cerebellar, spastic. then you, many times, swaying gait is mistaken as ataxia. Uh, because the, uh, if you have glue, uh, abductor muscles are weak, you have waddling type of gait. So, when the waddling has come later, so it will be strictly loyal limb. Relatives might tell it as an imbalance. But when we examine, you will find that there is a waddling rather than we should be very cautious many times Waddling is labeled as a tax investigate the upper story where the disease is in the muscles. So that also you should remember, especially the person being a child. So this is not, a, this is a progressive condition, not a static condition. Static conditions are very common in children. So it is not coming under that group. It's a progressive condition, seems to be involving the anterior lobe of the cerebellum to start with. Now the child has developed a slurring of the speech. So speech area, I told if speech is involved, it cannot be the pedantic. So we thought in the cerebellum, many things are there. Anyone could be contributing. And now we can clearly say it is not the pedantic. So speech is in the new cerebellum. So because the face, eyes, and upper limbs are represented in the new cerebellum. In the homunculus, face, eyes, and upper limbs are represented in the new cerebellum. Um, there is a diagram of homunculus. There is a diagram of homunculus in PPT. Yes, you, have, you got the three monkey homunculus. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so each language, music, three things are there in the cerebellum. One is uh, upper limbs. Yes, very good. Good. This only. You can see that the head, eyes, and upper limbs are all 
going towards the neocerebellum. This is paleocerebellum lower limb. This is floccular nodular. Uh, so this is floccular nodular loop. Here the leg will be coming. Good. So you put it uh, very nice. So because of that, you get eye signs. You get speech involvement of the classical cerebellar type and upper limb incoordination when neocerebellum is involved. Second, you can get uh, language involvement. Uh, when the floccular nodular lobe is connected to the subcortical language area. So language can be involved when there is a floccular nodular lobe involvement. And unlike the hemisphere where the language is in the uh, left yep. side, in the cerebellum it is on the right side. The right floccular nodular and parafloccular region involvement can produce language involvement. And with reference to language, uh, timing of communication, prosody, then uh, telegraphic nature, mutism, all these things are uh, seen and we call it a cerebellar mutism. Cerebellar mutism is because it is linked to the subcortical language area. Mary's quadrilateral space, we call it as. Subcortical language area produces a schema for uh, producing a type of, when I am speaking, there is a schema. That schema helps me to uh, move my appropriate muscles and bring out the correct words. So subcortical language area, otherwise called Mary's quadrilateral space, is the one which is connected to that. Because of that, cerebellum, when they is acutely insulted, it can produce mute state. They don't speak anything because they don't know how to uh, articulate the muscles. And later, they have severe dysarthria, uh, naming defect, and slowly recover over a period of time. Uh, whereas cerebellum and music, uh, music uh, of the cerebellum is on the uh, left side. And um, music, you have got something called talam and ragam. So ragam is all right. Talam, that is the timing. So timing becomes altered. So, uh, so these are the things which will happen. You can have a classical cerebellar speech, which is either staccato or scanning. When you say slurred, it means it is an altered speech uncharacterized. We use the term slurred speech when it is altered and uncharacterized. That when we examine, we may be able to tell whether in a, any other additional structure is producing the speech involvement or is it the cerebellum itself. So if it is going to be cerebellum, when you analyze, you are starting in the paleocerebellum and probably going towards the neocerebellum. Or if it turns out to be a spastic speech or something like that, in addition to cerebellum, some more structure is getting involved. That is the inference. But when you say slurred, it is not pointing to anything. It only means speech has been changed from what the speech was before. You do not know what kind of speech it is. So at this point for uh, undergraduate students, how do we classify the speech abnormality? We classify language. them. Yes, tell me. Good. Uh, language abnormalities and uh, speech abnormalities. Very good. Language abnormalities like aphasia hmm. and uh, mutism. Hmm. Uh, speech abnormalities like dysarthria, uh, which can be uh, spastic dysarthria, uh, flaccid, or uh, dyskinetic, uh, or ataxic or cortical dysarthria. Very good, very good. So language is the ability of the individual to convert thoughts into comprehensible modes of communication. So you are having a thought and you convert it into many modes of communication. It may be writing, it may be reading, it may be comprehending, it may be speaking, it may be repeating. So language has got four components or five components. That is re uh, reading, hearing, speaking, writing, repeating. So five components. So converting thoughts into comprehensible modes of communication for effective interaction. So I want to interact with you and you want to interact with me. So we have to convert it into an effective interaction which utilizes five methods. That is seeing, hearing, writing, speaking, and repeat. So all five components are there. Whereas speech is converting language into audible sounds. So language is already there. And only one component that is converting into audible sound that becomes affected you call it as a speech disorder so speech disorder has got only one component converting language into audible sound 
there as you typically said you are having a flaccid dysarthria you have got a spastic dysarthria you have got a dyskinetic dysarthria you have got an ataxic dysarthria and cortical dysarthria so akshay is very good you are uh, too good for a uh, mbbs student very good you are answering everything very nice ma good no so if it is um, flaccid dysarthria it is a muscles that are uh, producing the peripheral expression of the sound so it may be muscles of the tongue muscles of the palate or it may be muscles of the lips or uh, sometimes even edandrous person gets a kind of dysarthria once all the teeth are removed so that case very, very specific you need your lips to pronounce words which use p and b so papadam that kind of thing so uh, lily dot so those things uh, d t l is for uh, tongue and uh, teeth also dentals d guttural will be n g g g so egg sing bring so depending on when words containing this kind of letters are becoming altered it becomes flaccid dysarthria depending on what it is linguals or labials or dentals or gutturals you are going to implicate that particular muscle as the cause for the flaccid dysarthria and as he said spastic dysarthria by pyramidal involvement so double bar palsy uh, patients multi infarct syndromes so those people they um, syllables run into one another so syllables are not properly separated they are effortful they skew out the words so use uh, that is typically we use words like british constitution so there is an element of lisping so it will british constitution british constitution so they put some kind of ish kind of sound that we call it as a lisping common so effortful syllables are running into one another they are skewed out and they have an element of lisping that is spastic whereas ataxic is scanning or staccato yes ataxic ataxic means absent taxic means order so there is absence of order that is ataxia so yeah, absence of order means so what you see you may scanning speech you split it in normal order you don't split one word into its syllables so you split it so that becomes a scanning speech chakravarti rajagopal acharya generally we give that word so chakravarti so you lose the order in which a particular name is pronounced so a taxia means absence of order that is the meaning of that word so I split it and uh, you have an explosive component that is a staccato speech so because cerebellum controls rate range rhythm direction and amplitude of motor activity cognitive function everything so these things become altered rate range rhythm direction and amplitude are altered so it may become undulated erratic and lacks order resulting in either scanning speech or staccato speech then you got the dyskinetic you told classically dyskinetic speech may be due to hypokinetic or hyperkinetic hypokinetic is you have got okay. parkinson yes so you have a low voice volume monotony progressive slowing of the voice volume whereas you got the tremor chorea dystonia they produce a classical hyperkinetic speech disorder lingual tremor voice tremor or you get the dystonia where there is an orthogonal like right as cramp when you are speaking suddenly the tongue twists and stops there so you put into so these are the types of dysarthria but when you are not characterized you just know it has been altered you use the term slurred and after you examine you will know what kind of slurring that is can we are you able to characterize so it's not a language problem at present that's all we know it's a speech problem and what kind of it by slurred we don't know we know it is not normal so we we'll have to characterize it by examination so that is the second thing so that indicates uh, it is not the pedangle it is either the cerebellum or some other structure getting involved which can affect the speech so uh, in what is the next symptom head to turn to one side you said no yes. the head of the child turn to one side deviation that, of uh, deviation of deviation of the, to the right side 
right side no so do you, it's a small child no so that's a very important thing head deviation to one side is it to right side or left side or any one side it goes left side left side okay so head deviation to one side is a very important thing so you can uh, you would like to tell some causes ma would you like to tell ma forget about this child this is a very small child it came later but any child with a head tilt to one side what are all the things will go through your mind forget about this child any can child we... having head tilt to one side congenital uh, torticollis or acquired torticollis very good uh, congenital uh, torticollis can present with uh, due to sternocleidomastoid mustard tumor uh... wonderful so it is a shortening of the stenoma so you will say that it can start from the soft tissue it can be from the body or it can be from the intracranial structures or it can be due to correction for some eye movement problems so these are the uh, various situations you get to. Uh, so uh, you told about muscles no so in the muscles it can be uh, sternomastoid shortening due to injury to the sternomastoid in childhood so that is uh, at the level of the muscle uh, head tilt to uh, happens to opposite side second you, you got the neural structures lost no second you thought uh, uh, tell about the bony structures usually craniovertebral junction anomalies so supposing you have got a atlanta axial abnormality or some clippel field so it be a fixed turning to one side at a sudden so, so child is going on having so many other features there is a small fall or something like that and the dislocation becomes uh, fixed and the child will have a head tilt to one side so that is the second cause bony cause third i said about the ocular cause ocular cause will be is your heart of spasmus newtons your heart of condition called spasmus newtons no spasmus newtons is macular dysfunction a child with ataxia and macular dysfunction you see uh, can you tell me one condition where the child will have uh, macular dysfunction with ataxia no. if you don't frederick's, tell us no problem you know frederick's 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 you don't get macular you get an optic atrophy see so no, no, normally what happens if the children are kept in the dark room uh, i come from tamil nadu i know that in our place they tell that don't expose the children to the birds i am now thinking that because the bird droppings contains cryptococcus they may develop meningitis that may be the reason because of that reason they keep the children in the dark rooms so if the child is kept in the dark room macula does not um uh, develop in the time it should develop because of that child is unable to fixate on the object so that will produce a nystagmus so failure of fixation produces a nystagmus and to correct for the nystagmus there is a head nod and a head tilt so nystagmus with the head nod and a head tilt in children who are kept in the dark for longer period of time and uh, macula not developing that is called spasmus newtons and that will correct itself once the child is brought out to the light and macula starts develop but uh, you can get similar thing in ataxia with gait ataxia uh, you have got a bull's eye maculopathy yes ma'am what condition yes, ma what all conditions uh, chloroquine uh, very good wonderful mm, very good wonderful mm. and very uh, good. Mm. very good chloroquine agreed no. you are using chloroquine for covid and all hydroxychloroquine okay. it was used once not now i think okay so chloroquine that's an excellent answer and you have got neuronal ceroid lipofuscinosis have you heard of this condition it's a childhood ataxia where the same thing happens bull's eye maculopathy so macula has got a peculiar uh, bull's eye appearance yellowish center and uh, degener white is uh, degeneration around that is called bull's eye maculopathy so chloroquine is more common cause but uh, that does not produce ataxia chloroquine will produce bull's eye maculopathy does not produce ataxia 
progressive ataxia with bullseye maculopathy is NCL, neuronal ceroid lipofuscinosis in children. This is age group when it becomes symptomatic and it is progressive. So the, because the macula is not uh, uh, able to regain its function, unlike the classical spasmus neutons, where it is just because of light exposure is not there, once you expose the light, it will come back. Whereas conditions like NCL, it never happens. Macula does not develop at all. So they have a uh, head nod, head tilt, ataxia. Uh, so that is head tilt with ataxia due to macular cause. Then you can get this kind of head tilt when there is oculomotor apraxia. Yes. You have got episodic ataxia in children with oculomotor apraxia. Or you have got oculomotor apraxia in conditions like ataxia to lungectasia. But generally, it is not towards one side. It will be a tilted, so because they are not able to move the eye properly, they move the head. So head will be tilted to see every object. Instead of the eyeball moving, it will be the head that will move. So head will to the right side, if you want to look to the right side, head will move to the left side. Instead of the eye moving, the head moves because of the eye movement problem. This is seen with ataxia and ataxia to lungectasia or oculomotor apraxia with ataxia. That is also seen in children. Oculomotor apraxia with ataxia seen in children. So those are some conditions where the child will have a head deviation. Then you go to the uh, neural structures inside. As you told, torticollis, that is extrapyramidal involvement. So it can be dystonia. So the head may be deviating to one side as a manifestation of dystonia. In that case, you are going to think of a condition where there is cerebellar involvement and there is basal ganglia involvement. So more than one structure is it getting involved. So that is the next question you will ask, whether it's a dystonia, that you will have to see whether you are able to mechanically correct, are you finding any hypertrophic muscles? Is there a fixed posture? So that is uh, dystonia. Next, you have got the tectal lesions. You have got a dorsal midbrain lesion. Dorsal midbrain lesions, you can have uh, horizontal tilt center, it is called. You see, normally, uh, we are not, uh, it is a horizontal tilt center is there in the human being, but it is uh, vestigial. It is not having that much function. In uh, lower animals, they have a compound lens. So they study the three dimensions of the food particles like sugar solution or something like that by rotating their eyes. They rotate their eyes one down, one up, skew deviation with a head tilt. No? So this center is in the tecta. It doesn't go to the higher cortical structures. But in human beings, we don't have compound lens. We only have a simple lens. So we just study the object and the three dimensional reconstruction takes place in the visual association area, it is not in the tectum. So supposing there's a dorsal brain, midbrain lesion that disconnects this pathway, carrying the information from the simple lens of the human being to the visual association area, you become like the housefly, which is trying to study the foot particle by tilting the eyes and tilting the head. Tectum becomes the center instead of visual association area. So tectal lesions, they can have a head tilt. Then if you have sixth nerve palsy, sixth nerve palsy, you get an ipsilateral head tilt. Superior oblique palsy, you get a chondral lateral head tilt. That is all called null position adaptation. What is null position adaptation means when you have sixth nerve palsy, because you are coming around the brainstem, I am covering everything in that brainstem. When there is a sixth nerve palsy, you have got a horizontal double vision. In a superior oblique palsy, you are having a vertical double vision. So at some position, the double vision can be masked and you get a clear vision. That position is called null position. So the person will slowly learn, if I keep my head in this particular position, my double vision is very less. So that null position for the lateral rectus palsy is ipsilateral head tilt, whereas superior oblique palsy is contralateral head tilt. So these are some neural structures, then you have got the child, no? child you have got fourth ventricular tumors, middle of blastomas. They develop neurogenic vomiting and head tilt because it is linked to the horizontal 
ventricle center in the midbrain floor of the fourth ventricle carries fibers which are on their way to the horizontal uh, tilt center so these are the causes so this child ataxia going on and the head tilt is the child having an oculomotor apraxia is the child going to show an telangiectasia? ataxia we don't know or is it a fixed head tilt due to a cv junction anomaly with the cerebellar hypoplasia or not cherry malformations we don't know so the head tilt can be due to any of these we have to examine and associate with the child's problem so if you have fixed head tilt in a child like this it can be a craniotemporal junction anomaly if you have an eye movement problem and a head tilt it may be an oculomotor apraxia which happens in ataxia telangiectasia as well as without ataxia telangiectasia got eye movement problems in ataxia episodic ataxia you can have or we, as i said it may be an additional involvement of the basal ganglia if the basal ganglia is involved you are going to think of less uh, other conditions like wilson's disease or hypoparathyroidism or is it a neurodegeneration with brain ion accumulation these conditions involve both cerebellum and basal ganglia so all these wide differential diagnosis there we don't know why is the head tilted that you examine and then only find out the cause but general causes of head tilt we have discussed when we examine we will apply all this and find out what our child is having Next madam up. in this case it is a recent onset uh, head tilt since only 15 days ma'am did the child have a fall or something no sir fall child, if there is an at uh, or uh, craniotemporal junction anomaly you know the craniotemporal junction anomalies can produce unsteadiness due to ornal chiari malformations or it can be cerebellar hypoplasia so cerebellar hypoplasia is associated with cv junction anomalies so ataxia may be manifesting and mild uh, trauma or uh, slight fall uh, the bony thing might come into play and they can develop a fixed head tilt or uh, it can happen or what is causing this uh, is it an unrelated condition i don't know always you have to associate that is the best way so if you are associating all this possibility is there uh, child is progressing so it may be from the cerebellum picking up the basal ganglia we don't know uh, so all these possibilities are there so we have to examine and then only we will know why is the child head tilted to one side child is not vomiting and the no. attack is four years so tumors are less likely long duration progressive you know it's four years so long duration progressive uh, conditions in the neuraxis may be degenerations uh, tumors and That's slow good. virus like that we always tell tumors are very very unlikely so tumors which produce cerebellar ataxia in this age group will make the child bed bound by 4 years medulloblastomas hemangioblastoma cystic astrocytoma ependymomas no uh, these conditions do not go like this very slow for uh, brain stem gliomas no so they are common in children uh, medulloblastoma common as then brain stem glioma extending to the cerebellum or cystic astrocytoma hemangioblastomas but i will expect the child to have more vomiting uh, posterior fossa icp features and they can have head tilt due to brain stem involvement all this but four years no icp no vomiting very very unlikely so you have to consider uh, degeneration where the head tilt can happen in ataxia telangiectasia or ataxia with episodic Uh, oculomotor apraxia or it may be conditions like cvg anomaly where the ataxia comes first and the head tilt comes later due to some injury or something like that or is it a uh, uh, illness which started in the cerebellum and went on to involve the basal ganglia so a uh, torticollis occurred due to dystonia so this became the possibility when you associate the head tilt in, so uh, these are the things so associate the head tilt means uh, cvj one then basal ganglia involvement or apraxia eye movements i am not considering tumors even though in this age group it is there but uh, no no features of raised intracranial pressure and it is going on for four years which is very very unusual okay any other structure involvement no uh, no ma'am uh, then uh, uh, 
uh, there is a story of recurrent syndrome and all that of jobert syndrome yes ma'am uh, jobert syndrome uh, there will be uh, 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 on mri there will be inverted molar tooth appearance yes and uh, wonderful there will be there will be nystagmus and uh, uh, they will have lot of eye signs uh, they can have null position cat tilt when there is a nystagmus so they get lot of eye signs and adopt for the nystagmus or the other ocular manifestations they can also have a cat tilt so in this age group jobert's is a congenital condition so uh, molar tooth comes when you do the mri otherwise jobert's you can have cat tilt because to adopt for the eye movement problem children can have cat tilt mm -hmm. madam in this condition uh, there is no deviation of uh, head noted during sleep ma'am so it is not a fixed uh, uh, head tilt can we think of ocular causes only you can think of ocular causes even dystonia can disappear during sleep no yes, so this is history only now ma so from the history we uh, sleep uh, dystonia disappear du during sleep when you are lying down itself dystonia can go off so it can be ocular we cannot say now we have to examine ocular is very much possible ataxia telangiectasia and uh, oculomotor apraxia they are common in childhood ataxia so we have to consider we should not forget dystonia they also disappear during sleep okay any other conditions ma any other symptom only this uh, recurrent, re recurrent respir upper respiratory tract infection history is there oh. recurrent upper respiratory tract infection Uh, in a child with ataxia, what condition you get? If you want to uh, associate that. In ataxia, ataxia telangiectasia, there will be a, a congenital uh, immunodeficiency, uh, which can be associated. And uh, so, if that infection is related, you can consider ataxia telangiectasia as a possibility. Um, or is the child with low socio-economic status? Exposure to recurrent infection is causing that. that we don't know that is also very common people who live in less uh, kind of hygienic conditions are prone for repeated infections which may have nothing to do with iga deficiency but correlating ataxia with iga deficiency uh, you have to consider uh, ataxia telangiectasia that's a that is a thing which is uh, associated with repeated infections so that also will keep in our mind there hetil can happen due to apraxia oculomotor apraxia so at the end of the history uh, if you want to find, uh, analyze an ataxia in a child first thing is non progressive ataxia so children can have unlike adults we uh, different type of approach is there in children is it a progressive ataxia or a non progressive ataxia that's the first question non progressive ataxia also children, they may not know only when the child walk, starts walking and running people will recognize so if it is a non progressive ataxia as i told it may be ataxic cerebral palsy high in brain dysgenesis syndromes or it can be you know, post encephalitic sicule like you have got chicken pox varicella encephalitis they all can involve the cerebellum so post encephalitic sicule or post traumatic so it can be some kind of non progressive ataxia so second group is it a uh, intermittent ataxia so intermittent ataxia uh, in children you should never forget intermittent ataxia you got channelopathies so uh, you have got yes episodic ataxia which are channelopathies and some of them are amenable for treatment with uh, acetazolamide so channel the treatment option is there so we will not forget that so first group is it a static ataxia second it is an episodic ataxia so episodic ataxia may be a channelopathy or you have got episodic ataxia in amino aciduria children no children can have the channelopathy episodic ataxia 1 to 5 some of them respond to acetazolamide so better to remember that so third group of intermittent ataxia in a child is amino aciduria so when you give the dietary protein which is not capable of getting metabolized child will become ataxia when the diet contains that substance which cannot be metabolized like you are get it in heart knob disease urea cycle disorders pyruvate decarboxylase deficiency that is mitochondrial and then that is during fever or exertion and intermittent branch chain acidosis amino acid these are the classical uh, metabolic intermittent ataxias heart knob which will have the pellagra like rash 
which will give us the clue. And you have got urea cycle disorders. They will have the urea smell, and uh, they have they are drowsy, they vomit. No, you are following fever or something. Child gets fever repeatedly. You told. So mothers will think when we are all small. No, we all come from low middle class families. So when we are small, fever you get, you get harlicks. No, <laughs> so like that. If you get fever, the mother will feel child loss weight. So we will give lot of food. So they will give protein rich food. Urea cycle decompensates, uh, ammonia gathers, so child develops ataxia. So then with fever, mitochondria, mitochondria is unable to cope up. Mitochondria is the powerhouse. That powerhouse is okay for the normal BMR. When you have a fever, your BMR increases, basal metabolic rate increases. That the mitochondria is not able to cope up. So pyruvate decarboxylase or other mitochondrial disorders, they produce ataxia during fever. Then the branch chain amino acid areas. They are also because of the dietary changes. Okay, so these are the metabolic conditions. Then intermittent ataxia can happen due to even CVG anomalies. Even CVG anomaly can produce intermittent ataxia. What did you tell me? Hypothyroidism. Uh, yes, very good. So hypothyroidism can produce ataxia, but generally not intermittent. Uh, intermittent, if you want to tell Older people with Hashimoto encephalopathy, they can sometimes present with ataxia. But in children, uh, hypothyroidism is a very wonderful condition. So in children, it can produce with muscle involvement, as you know, characteristically paraspinal muscles. That is called cocker deber stimuli. So hypertrophy of the paraspinal muscle. Or uh, sometimes they get preconscious puberty. It is called Von Wick syndrome. Very important to remember because there is a hypothyroidism in the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So hypothyroidism is acting on the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and makes a neuronal error. Instead of when the thyroxine is less, it should produce more TSH. So instead of producing more TSH, it will produce LH and FSH. So child goes into precautious puberty. Imagine adrenal hyperplasia or pineal tumors and other causes of This is the best way of best treatable precautious puberty. That's called Von Wick syndrome. And then they can have ataxia. Mendel subnormal, so many things are there, but it is not really intermittent in the child. It's a subtle ataxia. So then other yeah, CVG anomaly can produce intermittent ataxia, depending on the position of the CVG, CVG bony structures, which change based on your head position, they can produce intermittent ataxia. Then there is an inter interesting condition, uh, we call it as auto brewery syndrome. That is also common in children because they don't live up to adults. What is auto brewery syndrome is a congenital cell mediated immune deficiency syndrome. Because there is immune deficiency of cell mediated type, the gut becomes filled with the candid. They die due to fungal sepsis. So uh, candid grows in their gut. So if you take a carbohydrate-rich food, the candid will act on the carbohydrate and convert the carbohydrate into alcohol. That is why it is called auto-brewery syndrome, self-alcohol syndrome. So alcohol is produced by the candid. So it is cell-mediated immune deficiency with systemic candidiasis. That is the uh, category of the immune deficiency. That is, I think, type 4. Type 4 is called cell mediated immune deficiency with systemic candidiasis. They, they die due to sepsis very early. So, but it will produce ataxia every time you give a carbohydrate. Then other causes of intermittent ataxia will be intermittent exposure to drugs and toxins, diphenylhydride and oil, or some drugs, uh, uh, anti-cancer, some drugs which are uh, specially anti-convulsants if they are intermittently exposed to the child. Uh, that uh, produce ataxia, then toxic substance alcohol in the grown up person, not in child. So, intermittent exposure to anti convulsants, higher dose can produce intermittent ataxia. So, is it a, a static ataxia? Is the first question. Second, is it an intermittent ataxia under this, all these categories? You will go through your mind. And uh, you have got episodic ataxia, febrile illness. That's also another condition. You have got vanishing brain syndromes and don't think of all those things. 
they are vanishing weight matter syndromes they can present with ataxia but it is too much for you but just remember you categorize a childhood ataxia into static ataxia or intermittent ataxia or a progressive ataxia under progressive ataxia is it a short duration progressive or long duration progressive short duration progressive may be infections demyelinations tumors a long duration progressive usually degenerations and of course cvg anomaly i will never forget and long duration progressive can be even metabolic disease like calcium uh, copper iron you know, on these conditions and other degenerative conditions like uh, new, uh, neuronal ceroid lipofuscinosis uh, basen konswick disease then uh, you have got uh, vitamin e response ataxia and even fredrick's ataxia starts very early one of the olden days criteria so when genetics was not there is onset before 10 years but uh, uh, now we know even there is a late onset fredrick's and you have got ataxia like jogren larsen marinescus jogren rafsoms they all start in the childhood they can be progressive so is it a non progressive ataxia is it an intermittent ataxia is it a progressive ataxia now we know it is a progressive ataxia so progressive ataxia is it short duration progressive long duration progressive so it is a long duration progressive so short duration conditions become cancelled off and there is a strong family history so clearly it is a um, pro most probably it is an inherited uh, ataxia of degenerative nature uh, in childhood so degenerative ataxias with or without so when we go to examine you are going to localize the ataxia is it a pure cerebellar is it a cerebellar plus other structures are involved based on that you are going to categorize so childhood ataxia may be fredrick's non fredrick's no under non fredrick's as say basen convex vitamin e responsive ataxia or you got neuronal ceroid lipofuscinosis then magnus goes jogren jogren larsen jobert syndrome now all these conditions are charlie wax shigani syndrome childhood ataxia of charlie wax shigani spastic ataxia uh, and I, i will never forget cvj i will never forget wilson i will never forget hyperparathyroidism because some treatment options are there and if the neck movement is dystonia i will not forget uh, brain ion accumulation syndromes uh, so this becomes the differential diagnosis so now we will examine them. examine the child okay so on general physical examination a child is comfortable and cooperative uh, mm. the vitals are stable there is no paler rectus cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy or edema Hmm. Okay. Next slide. Uh, anthropometry, uh, 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 it's normal. Next slide. Yes. Uh, head to toe examination. Uh, head uh, on the uh, normal. Hairs are normal. Eyes. Uh, horizontal nystagmus is present. There is no cataract. Iris is normal. Telangiectasia is present uh, on the lateral bulbar conjunctiva. There are no KF rings. Uh, no pingicula. Uh, no dysmorphic faces. Oral cavity. Tongue, teeth, and tonsils are normal. Ear normal. Uh, there is no discharge. Neck it is deviated to left side. There is no short neck. Chest is normal. Abdomen is normal. Upper limb telangiectasia is noted on the flexural aspect of wrist and elbow. Lower limb normal. There is no skeletal abnormalities. There are no neurocutaneous markers. External genitalia is normal. Uh, here there is a telangiectasia on the lateral aspect of bulbar conjunctiva on the in the right eye. Neurocutaneous okay. marker is there no more. You told telangiectasia in the eye and telangiectasia yes. in some other part also. So it becomes yes. a neurocutaneous now. What other yes. neurocutaneous markers you will look for in a ataxic child? Uh, we should look for uh, um, in the neurofibromatosis type two. Uh, yes. Very neurofibromas good. and uh, yes. for tuberous sclerosis. Yes. For tuberous white sclerosis. So white leaf macules. Uh, neurofibromas. Fragrance patch. which one more cataract chagrin spot yes very good so you look for white leafy macule neurofibroma subungal uh, fibromas subungal fibromas then other signs in a child you look for cataract aniridia then apart from ataxia you can have uh, av malformations av malformations in the uh, 
conjunctiva or in the retina you can get there are conditions called wyburn mason syndrome brain stem avm uh, ocular and retinal von hippel lindau cerebellar that's a cerebellar uh, arteriovenous malformation so you have also got um, aneurysm of veil of gallon that can also present with ataxia so you look for a bruy so in a child with ataxia apart from this you look for arteriovenous malformation cataract aniridia pingucula uh, pingucula will be seen in gotch's disease so uh, they can also present with ataxia then uh, retinal uh, cataract kf ring kf ring never forget so cataract kf ring and uh, retinal vascular malformations then as you classically told short neck weight leafy macular neurofibromas sub subungual fibromas uh, too tall too short because morphonoid or you can the echandroplasia they are prone for uh, cerebellar hypoplasia so are they having morphonoid body proportions are they having features of achondroplasia that are associated cvg anomalies so these are the things which we will carefully look for aniridia is other is called um, it's a aniridia with polycystic kidney and the cerebellar gilipsy syndrome gilips gilips syndrome gilips by syndrome so all, unless you look for you will not uh, uh, get it so these things you will look for so telangiectasia is seen yes good mom hmm. hmm. so head tilt may be due to oculomotory apraxia in this child child may be fixing for the null position because of an eye movement problem that may be there uh, so does the child have an eye movement problem yes ma'am oculomotor apraxia is present ma'am on cranial examination yes how did you uh, how do you differentiate it is too much for a small boy like you still i will ask you oculomotor apraxia saccadic initiation defect Uh, nystagm so many things are there now and uh, all this can produce a head tilt no yeah. does the child have any nystagmus nystagm or horizontal nystagmus is present uh, then we did uh, what other uh, how did you diagnose oculomotor apraxia um, what is the typical symptom of an oculomotor apraxia if you don't tell us no issue there will be defect in the orderly uh, visual motor scanning will, of the so you will uh, look uh, you will describe the eye signs in this child describe the eye movement apart from that actual telangiectasia describe the eye movement what is the resting eye position like oh. so is there a squint so resting okay. eye position you should see in straight forward gaze is there a squint we are skeptical i told it can happen due to lateral rectus palsy or can be due to superior oblique palsy If it is lateral rectus palsy, you have horizontal skin. If it is a superior oblique palsy, you have vertical skin. So resting eye position, you look for a skin. Then you can have skewed deviation when there is an additional brainstem involvement, supranuclear uh, brainstem uh, ocular disconjugation. So that is called skewed deviation. So resting eye position, look for a skin which is paralytic or non-paralytic. Non-paralytic is skewed deviation due to supranuclear cause. after that resting eye position you will check eye movements in all the cardinal planes horizontal vertical and oblique and you see whether there is any paralytic restriction of eye movement if that is not there you are going to look at the supranuclear supranuclear is saccade pursuit vergence so you should tell saccade is fast eye movements so you give two simultaneous charges or two fingers like that and tell the look at my right look at my left look at my left so that you can check the saccadic eye movement or command movement you can saccade can be even tested without a target without a target you can say look to the right look to the left look up look down so by command you can check saccade or by giving two targets and alternate between them then pursuit movement is a follow up movement slow follow up movement so then you will go on to describe how is the saccade how is the pursuit pursuit you are slowly following the movement you see able to follow the speed of your moving finger in the upward plane horizontal plane then vergence convergence divergence so this is how you describe an eye movement resting eye position 
is there a squint if the squint is there is it horizontal vertical is it paralytic non paralytic no then you uh, look at the supranuclear eye movement saccard pursuit and vergence if uh, uh, saccardic initiation defect is there also child will have uh, unable to so when do you use the term oculomotor apraxia when uh, there is so defect in the apraxia hmm. defect in the orderly uh, visual visual special scanning of anyone no apraxia is defined as inability to carry out a learned motor act on command in the absence of paralysis that is apraxia so inability to carry out a learned motor act on command in the absence of paralysis so your patient should not have any paralysis child should not have any saccardic initiation defect but you give a command saccardic initiation defect on command also it will be there spontaneous also it will be there whereas voluntary reflex dissociation it is too much more for a small boy like you still is a voluntary reflex dissociation voluntary is on command reflex is spontaneous so use the term apraxia if when you give a command to the child so inability to carry out a learned motor act in the absence of paralysis on command it's a language link function so apraxia is a function of the dominant side language link so you give a command child is unable to do but when you are simply watching the child is moving here and there you see do you carrying out those movement and you try to elicit the movement with optokinetic tape the reflex movement is there then you typically call it as oculomotor apraxis so voluntary movement is defective spontaneous movements are there when you are not giving the command child is spontaneously moving and when you move with an optokinetic tape you are able to bring out a reflex movement in the side where the child is unable to initiate the movement you understand no? yes, so sir. just forget about all this apraxia is not for a undergraduate student but because you told it uh, you just remember because when we are undergraduates also one of my teachers used to teach he told no harm in learning just keep it in the back of your mind it will be recycled so many times so when you become a post graduate it becomes easy to understand so apraxia definition you remember and if you saw that the movement is there spontaneously and and, and reflexly but when you give a command it is not there then it becomes apraxia the saccardic initiation defect is not there in all situations saccardic initiation defect is not there in all situations usually childhood apraxia they present with the head nod so they will be not a fixed nod as you said in this child they will be continuously moving like this like a blind child they will be or when you give a command they do like that it will look to the right side because they are not able to initiate an eye movement they move the head with a jerk uh, so spontaneously the eye come that side so it's a moving the head with a jerk and the eye follows that's what you will find and these are the various parameters just think that you heard it after your exam if you are interested you can read about apraxia yes sir neurology is full of uh, uh, mysterious uh, features ma it is not a very crude subject it's not a crude subject it is a uh, very philosophical very great uh, subject uh, from the cost basis to your titubation titubation is seen in vermis involvement ma titubation can be seen in many conditions it can be seen in senile tremor aortic regurgitation you call it as alfred demeser sign and you can have cerebellar vermis involvement you can get a titubation okay titubation you don't get in apraxia apraxia you get a head which jerks like that you give a command instead of the eye moving the head will jerk like that and the eyes follow and you will demonstrate all these features which i have told okay then what else you found In all other cerebellar signs you found in this child, or whatever signs you found, you tell me. Yes, ma'am. On system, uh, systemic examination. Uh... Uh, higher mental functions: uh, conscious, oriented to time, place, and person. Uh, right-handed. 
memory is intact uh, speech there is a slow scanning speech with uh, unintentional pauses able to comprehend the spoken words uh, reduced tone of voice and the fluency is affected suggestive of ataxic dysarthria uh, cranialum examination uh, uh, third fourth and sixth cranial nerves ocular motor apraxia is uh, present uh, the rest of the cranial nerves are uh, normal Uh, motor examination uh, bulk is uh, equal on uh, corresponding sides uh, tone there is decreased tone in both upper and lower limbs on both the sides power is uh, 4 by 5 uh, in both upper and lower limbs on both sides uh, reflexes uh, uh, biceps and triceps it is 2 plus uh, knee jerk it is 2 plus with pendular ankle jerk it is 2 plus and uh, bilateral plantar uh, flexor uh, cerebellar uh, signs uh, titubation is absent nystagmus is uh, horizontal nystagmus is present ocular motor apraxia is present finger nose test uh, in coordination is present this didacokinesia is present fast pointing is present pendular knee jerk is present uh, heel to knee test uh, in coordination is present uh, uh, coming to gait uh, stance wide based with uh, foot abducted and uh, increased intermalleolar distance uh, gait there is no limp or a short limp uh, normal initiation irregular stride uh, swaying to either side with unsteady turns Uh, tandem walking uh, or child was unable to do good so which all parts of the cerebellum seems to be involved uh, since the there is a dysarthria also involved in it uh, so uh, along with the pelvic cerebellum uh, apparently it's a pan cerebellar except that you are not having the floccular nodular type of features it is a pan cerebellar syndrome bilateral symmetrical with telangiectasia and eye signs you don't have any differential diagnosis the only one diagnosis hmm? yes. so what all things uh, investigations you did no you have only one diagnosis for this child what uh, all investigations you diagnosis did? is uh, hereditary ataxia ataxia telangiectasia investigations are um, uh, complete blood count um, and uh, rft and uh, serum electrolytes was done Uh, total count was uh, 18200 uh, with the granulocyte 76% and lymphocyte 15.8% uh, platelets was uh, uh, 3.65 and uh, hemoglobin was 7.2 uh, no mri brain was done which showed a uh, cerebellar atrophy yes, next uh, this was the uh, mri films okay next mm. this two are the mri films Okay, you did not do this alpha fetal protein and all. Uh, no. Generally, you find the alpha fetal protein elevated, and uh, you should avoid. It's a very clear case. Diagnosis is uh, very obvious, and uh, you should avoid taking X-rays. Yes, it's a DNA repair disorder. CT scan and X-rays can induce malignancies. Uh, it can be lymphoreticular malignancies or cutaneous malignancies. so avoid uh, infection avoid uh, exposure to radiation mm, that's all you can do and you don't uh, you have some symptomatic treatment gait training and uh, eye movement training they can also develop extrapyramidal then you manage the dystonias and uh, that is the treatment option usually they develop uh, uh, malignancies and uh, that shortens their life so diagnosis straight forward but i uh, i suppose you understood the localization which we discussed with uh, brief only with reference to this case and for an yes. undergraduate student akshay seems to be wonderful you know very good ma uh, very you, ma. very wonderful i should appreciate you like anything for an art your age i did not know uh, many of these things so you have answered uh, everything so very nice keep it up thank you ma'am thank you very much very good excellent any doubt is there sir no, uh, one doubt out of this uh, um when are like this patient uh, we are thinking of ocular motor apraxia in this patient yes ma'am uh, how to like particularly take the differential while examining ma'am uh, no that's not differential ocular motor apraxia, 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 apraxia the differential diag- diagnosis is saccadic initiation defect these are the two things become the differential diagnosis is it an apraxia 
or is it a saccadic initiation defect? That is why you should go systematically. Both these groups of children will have a head like that. They will tilt their head. Uh, if, they uh, if they tilt their head, it may be a saccadic initiation defect where to compensate for the slow saccade, they are moving their eye or because of the apraxia, they are moving their eye. This is the question. Apraxia, as I said, has got some component. Even though mostly apraxia and saccadic initiation defect are interchangeably used at the bedside. So, but if you are specifically want to use, you should have checked the saccade initially. As I told, you can give two targets or you can give a command movement and you find that the saccadic initiation time is normal, saccadic amplitude is normal and saccadic step is normal. So, saccadic pulse, saccadic velocity and saccadic step is so, saccadic pulse is the initiation. You tell, look to the right, immediately you are looking to the right. That means saccadic initiation is all right. And saccadic amplitude, you are not having a hypometric or a hypermetric. So, you are not stopping short of the object or overshooting the target. So, saccadic amplitude and velocity is all right. It is neither hypermetric nor hypometric. And after the saccadic step, so when it reaches the target, is it able to stay there? Or is it drifting beyond or uh, ahead. So, all these three components of saccade is normal. Then you give a command movement to the child. Child is doing this head movement. And you are able, you do your optokinetic tape. You are able to initiate the optokinetic movement properly. And when you are observing the child in your ward, child is normally able to initiate the eye movement when the command is not given. So, apraxia is voluntary reflex dissociation in the absence of paralysis, so the arm on command. So even though commonly oculomotor apraxia is loosely mixed with the saccadic initiation defect, if you tell specifically it is not saccadic initiation defect, it is apraxia, then you should be able to demonstrate that saccadic movements are normal and there is voluntary reflex dissociation. Understood, huh? Yes, madam, yes. Yes. We often exchange these uh, terms loosely. Uh, always it happens, but uh, strictly speaking, this is how you have to tell. Any other question? Neurology is philosophy. Ma. So nowadays, a lot of neurologists are there. They are, many of them are fibromyalgia neurologists or very quick neurologists who don't bother about the neuraxis. But uh, Akshay seems to be very good uh, Vijay seems to be committed. He is there. I don't have to tell anything about him. But uh, Akshay seems to be wonderful. But if you want to study neurology, uh, forget about the material aspects because you have to handle it with care. It is not a waste paper speciality. Because neurologists do not know neurology many times. We put them in the waste paper basket. You can handle them with care, properly studying neurology like philosophy, our patient's quality can be improved to a great extent. So it should be philosophical approach to the subject that is needed for a good neurologist. I am not telling you to become a neurologist, it's your choice, but you are very well read and I am so impressed for an undergraduate student. Wonderful. Thank you very much.